service. Five minutes. Five minutes. I want to welcome you again this morning to our Sunday service. As you can see behind me, we're, we're back home. We're at the, uh, at the Red River Meeting House. We're here at the site of the, the great revival of, of 1800. And this is, a, this is a wonderful place to be. The, the, the weather is, is cool, it's in the 70s, and the humidity is in about 150%, but we're grateful, <laughs> we're grateful for, the, uh, for the cool weather. Uh, I asked you as we, as we joined together, we have, we have friends uh, or people visiting the site here. Uh, they may be walking through the camera occasionally and, uh, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a great thing. A historic site that has, that has visitors is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But we're here for church this, this morning and I would invite you to gather with me. Reading the collect for this, the, this morning, Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We turn this morning to the book of Isaiah, and I've chosen the first six verses of Isaiah 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places. He makes her wilderness like Eden. He makes her desert like a garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people. Give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out for me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm 
they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look to the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke and the earth will wear out like a garment. And they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will dwell forever and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Would you join me this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer? Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, again, that we are able to worship together is an honor and a privilege. That we are able to come into your presence uh, is a wonder to us. And Father, we must recognize that it is into your presence that we are coming this day. It is before you that we stand. And we ask that you welcome us. We ask that through the righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ, you welcome us into your presence. And Father, may we recognize your glory. May we recognize who you are. Father, this day it is my prayer that you will bless the words that are spoken, the words that are heard, the scriptures that are read. And as I am wont to pray, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've chosen some hymns uh, for you to sing along with this morning, and I would ask you at this time, join us. We again, as, as it are, is our tradition, want to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, our hearts are heavy. One that we prayed for last week uh, that, that was still, still hanging on to life has, has now passed. And we want to pray for, for Anita and the loss of Dean. Uh, we, we mentioned friends uh, many times. And, and when you see us, you see, you see Parson and Maggie and, and Frank and Carol and, and uh, uh, different different ones, Pat and Rudy, we, 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 we have names that we, that we lump together, and Anita and Dean, uh, and, and in the loss of Dean, we want to, we want to pray uh, for, for Anita. We also want to pray for uh, Royce, uh, the family of, of Royce the Spoon Man, uh, who, who passed this week, whose funeral uh, will be in uh, Warsaw, Indiana uh, tomorrow. Uh, there's a notification if you, if you care to, to search for it upon, upon my page. Uh, but we want to pray. We want to pray for these. We want to. We want to remember uh, those those that have have gone on before us, and and there there are others. Uh, I'm I am mindful of of others that that have that have suffered strokes in in years past, of of, of Mr. Ferris, of 
of, of, of Rebbe, of, of others that, that in, in, the, in the seemingly distant past, five, six years, one or two years, we've, we've prayed for them. And, and we've, we've asked God to, to hold them up, to, to lift up their, their families. And, and, and we want to, we want to, to remember uh, Brutes. We want to remember uh, Rebbe. And we want to remember these, these others that, that are in a continual uh, a state of, of, of improvement, of, of seeking and needing medical care. So as we go to the Lord, those friends that you have, I ask you to, to, to lift them up, to bring them before the throne of grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, uh, as we come into your presence, we, we do remember. We remember Bruce, Bruce Ferris, and we remember uh, the, the, the stroke that, 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 that he suffered so many years ago. And we, we pray for Karen. We pray for, for John and for Rebbe. We pray for, for others that, that we're, we're aware of that are, that are needing comfort and, and healing still in, in their bodies. And Father, we, we lift these to you. We lift Anita in, in the loss of Dean. We lift uh, the friends of Royce, the, his family uh, and all. Uh, the hole that he leaves in our hearts and the hole that he leaves in our community is, is great. The same the same with Dean, the same with many others. So we pray today for those in, in loss. We pray for those that are recovering. We pray for those that need a touch of your hand. We thank you because we do see you working. We thank you because we do see the comfort that you send. And we thank you because we know that you are with us. You said you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. So, Father, these are our requests that we bring and we lay at the foot of the cross, thanking you that you hear and answer prayer. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. What I'd like to bring uh, a message today, uh, again, standing, standing in the place where we are, where, where revival took place, I, I, I want that to be perhaps not as the, the main thrust of, of my message, but this, this has to be, this has to be a, a component of, of God's Word, a component of what the Lord would have us to understand, what the Lord would have us to understand about how we serve Him. I'm drawn to 1 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul is writing to a church, He's writing to a church that exists in a place of strife. It exists in a place of, of sin. Corinth is, is, is not the best city in Greece. It is, it is, a, it is a place where, where much is going on. And while Paul deals with the things that are going on in Corinth, he is talking to the church, and he's talking about the things that are going on in Corinth the church. Verse 10 of that first chapter, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been recorded to me by, by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, uh, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one might say that you were baptized in my name, Paul writes. And then parenthetically, he says, I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not even know if I baptized anyone else. Verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. My friends, we are a, a people divided. We are a church divided. And we're in need of one thing that can unite us, and that is God Himself, a move of God. This is what we might refer to as a revival. 
Well, what does this look like? We're, we're historians. We're living historians. And, and, and we, we, we search and we want to know what, does, what did it look like at the Alamo? I see a lot of things about the Alamo. What did, it, what did it look like? How did it take place? What did it look like in Boonesboro? What did it look like uh, with Joseph Martin, Thomas Sumter, and all the others? What did it look like? Well, when we want to look at our relationship with God, where do we go? We go primarily to the primary source. We go to the Scriptures themselves because the Scriptures are the Word of God. And we've seen this revival. We've seen this coming to God. We've seen God moving within His people in Scriptures. And we'll look at that in the first place. In the second place, we've seen God move in, in history. And lo, this is, where, this is where we are standing, for we see coming from this place a mighty move of God that is still felt in our nation today. Waning as it is, it is still, it is still here. But where do we find this? Where do we find this in, in Scripture? Our Bible is divided into Old and New Testaments. The Old Testament is giving us the, the law uh, and, the, and the prophets, the things that are looking forward to Christ. The New Testament is giving us Christ and those that are explaining or giving an application of, of Christ. And, and I want to look at, at two Old Testament revivals. I want to look at two moves of God. And both of these are coming from a time and a place when it was a surprise that, that, that God moved, but He moved nonetheless. In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah has, has come back from, from Babylon. He's come back from exile. He has brought uh, a number of people with him. They have rebuilt the wall of, of, of Jerusalem, and, and they are gathered together uh, in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book, to bring the law of Moses. Verse 2 of, of Nehemiah 8, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. We can, we can track when that is. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They're hearing God's word preached. And what does it look like when they hear and understand what God is, is saying? Now, on the understanding side, they, 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 they built a platform, a platform which would have graced these grounds and the grounds at Gasper River, and the grounds at Muddy River, and the grounds at Cane Ridge, platforms that, the, that, that, that the, the, the Parsons could stand upon to be able to have their voice to project across a crowd. Ezra is on such a platform, and beside him stood a group of men. And as he opened the word, these men made sure that everyone could understand it. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people, and he, as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. Lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book, verse 8, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. When God's Word is put forth, when God's Word is faithfully uh, recounted and told and faithfully explained, then people are convicted, people understand, and they see what, what the message is for them. A second place in the Old Testament, a second place where we see, where we see revival, and I've gone from from Nehemiah to uh, to Second Kings, this twenty-second chapter, and this 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 king of of Judah, 
named Josiah. He was eight years old when he began to reign. I have, a, I have an eight-year-old grandson that it's a, it's a pleasure to see him uh, moving about and to see his, his intellect uh, developing, his, his understanding of, of God developing. But, but as, he is a, as he is a child, I, I, I know that there's, there's much more for him to understand as he, as he gains age and gains wisdom. So Josiah was, was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. We know his mother's name. We know uh, that she was the daughter of, of, of this person. And that we know that Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the way of David his father and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. But in the 18th chapter of that, uh, or in the 18th year of, of King Josiah, the house of God had fallen into disrepair. The house of God was literally crumbling. Oh, an offering was taken, a regular offering was taken, and, and it, was, it was seemingly being, being misused by those uh, in charge of, of God's, God's house. So in the 18th year of King Josiah, uh, the king sent uh, his servant, uh, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, and he says, go to the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought to the house of the Lord, that the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people, and let it be given to the hand of the workmen and to the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the workmen who are at the house of the Lord repairing the house. Let's skip the middle man. Let's go directly to where the money needs to go. And that's not the point of the message. The point is that they were seeking to repair God's house. And they were doing it with, with stones and with, with wood and with workmen, carpenters and builders and, and, and masons. But here's the interesting part, is while they were in the midst of this, this reclaiming of, of God's house or this, this renovation of God's house, they found something. They found a book. A book that was lost? A book that was lost in the house of God? And, and what, was, what was this book? It was the book of the law. Lost in God's, in God's house. This is, this is remarkable. But we shouldn't stand in, in condemnation of, of, of these, these folk for, for how many churches don't open a Bible? How many churches do not proclaim God's word in, in our day? So what did, they, what did they do with the book that they found? Hilkiah, the one, one that was affecting the repair, took it to, to the, the secretary and he read it. And the secretary brought it to the king and reported to the king. It says, your servants have emptied out the money and, that was found in the house and de delivered it to the, to the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house. And then the priest found this book. And the secretary then read the book before the king. And what was the effect that happened when that book was read? Verse 11 of 2 Kings uh, chapter 22. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkah the priest and Achaim the, the son of, of Shepham and Ankor the son of Micaiah and the secretary and, and, the, and the servants and saying, go inquire of the Lord for me. What are we to do? What are we to do for this? For the great wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book that has been written concerning us. A great discovery was made. And then a great discovery of what was contained in this book. And this word, this discovery, much like with Nehemiah, it caused the people to bow with their faces to the ground. It caused the king to tear his clothes because he realized, he realized of the sin that they had. The sin not only of, of him personally, but the sin of, of the nation. And repentance was necessary. 
you know, the, the children of Israel had not celebrated Passover for years and years. They had forgotten. They had forgotten the very thing that was the symbol of the Messiah to come, the symbol of the sacrifice that was to be made for their sin. The word was forgotten. God's word was, was lost. It was hidden away. And consequently, they strayed and they drifted further and further from God. Is this not where we find ourselves in our day? Is this not where we find ourselves uh, coming and, 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 and needing God, realizing, realizing our need? We, we, we remember when I, when I spoke a few weeks ago of, of, of Job, of Job declaring, oh, that, that there were an umpire betwixt us. Oh, that there were someone to, to intercede, to grab God's hand and to grab my hand and to bring us together. This is, this is the message that was forgotten. This is the message that was abandoned. Yes, there in the law of Moses is Christ explained to us. So we see in Nehemiah's time, we saw, uh, we saw revival. In Josiah's time, we saw revival. Well, what about, what about in, in the New Testament? In the New Testament, we see, we see a mighty move of God there in the second chapter of Acts. Peter, the very one that denied that he knew Christ, is standing there just 50 days later on, on the day of Pentecost, and he is opening God's Word again to a people that have abandoned. They have forgotten what the gospel is. And what does Peter say to them? He identifies Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. He identifies them as being the one that have, have crucified the Son of God Himself. He opens God's Word to them and explains to them from the Word, from the Bible, that this is, this is what has happened. This is what has taken place. And what is the result? Like with, with Nehemiah, again, bowing to the ground, like with Josiah, again, we are, we are rending our clothes because we are realizing that we are an unholy, unworthy people. And in this, too, uh, Acts 2, verse 37, at the end of the, of the sermon that, that, that Peter gives, they say, And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off. Did we not talk about this on Wednesday night when Jesus, there in the 17th chapter of John, prays for the ones that will come, the ones that will come to Him through the testimony of, of His apostles. And He's talking about uh, just a few, days, a few days hence. He's talking about years hence. He's talking about decades and centuries and millennia. He is talking about us, those who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. And with many other words He bore witness and continued to exhort them. We can't think that Peter's sermon was only about 12 and a half minutes long or, or 30, 20-some verses long. But he continued to exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. My friends, when God moves, it is... It is through, it was through Peter, it was, it was through Nehemiah, it was through, through, through Josiah, the, the servants that, that, that God called. But if we look to Peter, if we look to Josiah, if we look to, to Nehemiah, we're going to see men with feet of clay. We're going to see, we're going to see men of, of failings. Uh, they are giving us the word. 
They are giving us the, the, the word of God, and it is the word of God that must change our hearts. It is the word of God that must affect our souls. And what is the effect that it has in all of these instances? And I haven't gotten into history yet. I'm going to touch on that just a little bit, I'm recent history. In all of these instances, they have seen that they are unworthy. They have seen their sin. They have seen their need of God. This message was delivered without a lot of baggage. It was a pure message. It was a clean message. It was one that cut to the heart of the situation. It was one that showed everyone their need of Christ. We can look, we can look then to, to history and what have revivals looked like in history. We've had, we've had basically two types of revivals uh, in our history. We have had revivals where they have been man-led, man-invented, uh, man-promoted, and they are fleeting, they are temporary, they are lacking in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are promoted. They are, they are, uh, they, they, they are, they are divisive. They are everything against what the scripture would, would, would tell us. They are, they are men standing in, 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 in a pulpit declaring, declaring a partial gospel, perhaps, declaring just enough of Jesus Christ so that we don't boot them out of the pulpit, but their intentions are nothing but selfish, and their result is temporary. But when God moves, when God's word comes, this is the second type of the second type of revival, and I'm going to say that we've we've seen this in our country. We've seen this in in, in, in the late 1720s, the 1730s. We've seen this in the 1790s. We've seen this at 1800 here where we're standing. We're going to see this again in 1830. We're going to see it again in 1858. We're going to see it many times uh, throughout, throughout our, our history. And every one of these moves are going to have things in common. One thing that they're going to have in common is they're not going to know that a revival has started. They're not going to know the effect of it. They're, they're, they're going to realize that God is moving in, in the hearts of people. But it is, it is God's moving. It is not man's promotion. Secondly, we're going to see prayer. We're going to see more time spent in prayer than anything else. God said, my house is a house of prayer. And when people fall on their face uh, in front of, of God, begging, seeking for Him to move in their hearts, then He sends a revival. Thirdly, in a revival that is, that is true, we will see the Word of God faithfully expounded. We will, we will leave aside the popular notions the popular notions that we see creeping into our church, the popular notions that we see dividing us even as I speak, those things must be stripped away. Paul said, if you preach another gospel, then it is, it is, it is heresy. If you take the gospel of Jesus Christ and put something on top of it, and you say you've got to believe this before you can believe that, then you have led people astray into heresy. We cannot gather together for the gospel and proclaim anything other than the gospel. We can't form a group that is, that is going to, to, to form together for, for promoting the gospel and then, and then simply misplace the gospel and start promoting heresy. We'll find ourselves in the position of one that the Apostle John talked about. He said they, they were among us. They went out from us, and they are no longer of us. My friends, it is the pure gospel that must be proclaimed. It is Jesus Christ upon the cross. I, I, I mentioned last week 
the purpose why he was there, the work that he did, why he had to go to the cross. Why did God himself have to become man, suffer and die in our place? Because there is no forgiveness of sin outside that. The writer to the book of Hebrews in the sixth chapter says that those that have been, have been enlightened, those that have understood the washings, those that have even understood the prophecies of the Messiah, if they forsake the Christ that came, then there is no further forgiveness of sin. This is written to the Hebrews. This is written to a people that understood the law and understood the progression of how, how, we, how we come to understand the Messiah. But when the Messiah came, they rejected Him and would have gone on with their sacrifices. And God says, those sacrifices are in effect because you cannot, you cannot sacrifice again the Lord of glory. My friends, we come, we come to God. We come uh, realizing that, that our Christianity must be pure. It must be gospel-centered. It must be Christ-centered. It must be cross-centered. It must be led by the Holy Spirit. What's the cause of revival? The cause is the Holy Spirit. On our part, it is hearing. Hearing God's Word. It is believing. Believing in Him who sent Christ to die for us. It is repenting. Turning away from our lost selves. And what is the result? The result is a holy people. Colossians Chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. This is who we must be. And we can only be this through the influence of God Himself. And, and He has done the work. He's done the hard work upon the cross. And He comes to us and He says, Submit yourself. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And again, what did I say a few weeks ago? Remember, Jesus, He took a basin. He took a towel and wrapped it around His waist. He stripped off His outer coat and, 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 and washed the feet of the disciples. Christ came as a servant. And this is the mind that He would have us be in. This is, these are the things that the gospel leads us to. These are the things that the gospel will produce in us. These are the things that will unite us, regardless of what lines we draw between us. It is the gospel that unites us. It is the gospel that teaches us servanthood. It is the gospel that teaches us how we treat our fellow man. Is this the end result of revival, that we'll all get along? No, the end result of revival is that we will know Christ in His fullness. The greatest benefit of knowing Christ is knowing Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, again, we are, we are so grateful for Your revealed Word to us. We're grateful for what You have, have taught us. We're grateful for what You've taught us through history. We're grateful for what we have seen in the people that are recorded in the Bible. We thank you. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for being divided. Forgive us for not following your gospel. Forgive us for putting other things in front of your gospel. Father, lead and guide us into your righteousness through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. 
Amen. As a benediction today, I'd like to share with you uh, some from Paul's writings uh, from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I, I, gave, you, I gave you a portion from the, from the beginning of, of, of the book, uh, a warning as, as it were. And here it, at the next to the last chapter of the book, the 50th verse. Hear the word of the Lord through Paul, his servant. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body will put on the imperishable. And this mortal body will put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I want to thank you again uh, for joining me this morning. I want to thank you for, for taking the time to join together with, with all of us in, in, in worshiping the Lord. And it is my prayer that as you open the Scriptures, the Lord will continue to reveal Himself to you. In the coming weeks, we have some, some more exciting places that, uh, that we're going to, be, going to be going. There's this little station in the southwest corner of, of Virginia that has given me uh, permission to be able to, to do uh, a service, and we're going to, Lord willing, do that next week and join you from Martin Station. And then in the coming weeks, we'll see you at various, various historic, historic places. Wednesday night, we want to, uh, want to invite you again. Uh, it's 6 o'clock Central Time, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, and we will be opening up the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John. I, it's, it's hard for me to, to wrap my mind around the fact that we've been doing this this long. Uh, so we've been doing this. We're in the 18th chapter. We're 19 or 20 weeks uh, into into this with technical difficulties and, and introductions and, and such. But join me again next Wednesday night. May the Lord be with you and may the Lord bless you.